This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God, read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue unlearning the world with Book 2. In Chapter 5, this is Section 6, Going Beyond the Obvious, Part 2, Seeing the Problem as it is. David Now you are being shown you can escape. All that is needed is you look upon the problem as it is and not the way that you have set it up. We are back to seeing that the problem is in the mind. Wrong-mindedness is the problem. Right-mindedness is the solution. Right-mindedness is seeing the problem as it is. Wrong-mindedness is the way you have set it up. Seeing problems as specific in the world and involving personhood in some way. How could there be another way to solve a problem that is very simple? but has been obscured by heavy clouds of complication which were made to keep the problem unresolved. Without the clouds, the problem will emerge in all of its primitive simplicity. The choice will not be difficult because the problem is absurd when clearly seen. No one has problem making up his mind to let a simple problem be resolved if it is seen as hurting him and also very easily removed. Text chapter 27, section 7 Friend, that is raising the darkness to the light, just bringing it into the light and exposing its results in its Removal. David. Yes. An idea came through today when writing the mission statement for the Foundation for the Awakening Mind. One idea was to remove. Messengers see that they must look at the darkness and they must examine all beliefs and raise them to the light. That is a pretty common statement. We talk about raising beliefs to the light. But it needed to be deeper. The way the statement came out was They understand that to receive miracles requires that they raise the darkened belief system ego in their minds to the light of truth. It clumps the plural into a singular. Friend, there is one false belief, no matter how many forms it takes. David, there is just one, though it seems to take many different forms. The clarity and joy of enlightenment is in seeing that there are not many. It is just one belief system. One belief that has to be seen where it is. In the mind. The key is seeing the error. Raising the error to the light. And then all of the specific forms. Time, space, bodies, etc. Are seen correctly. It is like an overhead projector with stacks and stacks of overlays. You could just look at the stack, the stack of overlays. It has to be raised up. It can be helpful to talk about it in terms of concepts because there does seem to be a process of looking at all the concepts and the deceived mind 
can relate to that process. That is why we have the stages of the development of trust. That is why the workbook has 365 lessons. And why Jesus uses the term process at times. Because that is what the deceived mind can relate to. That is the only thing it can relate to because it believes in incremental, sequential time. What else is a process but sequential timing? The reasoning by which the world is made, on which it rests, by which it is maintained is simply this. You are the cause of what I do. Your presence justifies my wrath and you exist and think apart from me. While you attack, I must be innocent and what I suffer from is your attack. Text Chapter 27, Section 7 The key line is, while you attack, I must be innocent. You see the subject-object split? And can you also see how underneath that statement is the belief that attack and innocence can coexist? But the Course teaches that if attack is real, innocence is not. Since attack is unreal, innocence is real. They cannot coexist. No one who looks upon this reasoning exactly as it is could fail to see it does not follow and it makes no sense. Yet it seems sensible because it looks as if the world were hurting you. And so it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. Text chapter 27, section 7, para 3 Whether you are watching the news, reading the newspaper, or just looking around, it seems like the cause of all hurt and suffering is in the world. Not enough food, not enough clean air to breathe, pesticides, diseases, burglars, and wars. There are so many things in the world that seem to be the cause of all the misery and upset. Because of all these seeming causes, it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. But none of those things are the cause. This is why we look so carefully at every single belief in the mind. There is a need to look for cause within the mind and not to keep relying on the belief that the cause of my upset is in the world. The world's escape from condemnation is a need which those within the world are joined in sharing. Yet they do not recognize their common need. For each one thinks that if he does his part, the condemnation of the world will rest on him. And it is this that he perceives to be his part in its deliverance. Text chapter 27, section 7, para 4. I remember having thoughts about martyrdom. I thought, this is so radical, so different from the world. I would just get flashes of myself being a martyr. A typical interpretation of Christianity has been that anyone who would completely follow Christ must in some way be ready to bear the cross, as he did. 
I remember one fellow who was writing about Christianity, said, It has been tried and found to be too difficult. <laughs> When you begin to look at the teachings and really follow them in, it can seem to be too difficult or impractical. In a sense, that is what we are reading about in this paragraph. For each one thinks that if he does his part, the condemnation of the world will rest on him. And it is this that he perceives to be his part in its deliverance. As if somewhere along the line I am going to have to pay a price for following this course. As if there is a bitter pill to swallow as part of your salvation. It cannot be that there is a price to pay for what you are. I remember hearing a discussion about someone who described his moment of awakening from the dream as excruciatingly painful. That is certainly not my experience of it. The Course mentions often that you will at first awaken to happy dreams. Why would there be passages about happy dreams? Happy dreams are dreams that are purified of all the intentions and purposes of the ego. You are right-minded in the position of the dreamer of the dream. Wouldn't it be happiness to know you are free and there is nothing on the screen that can influence you, affect you, or take away your happiness. My experience has been that of a gentle presence and easy-goingness about life. There is no more rush involved and nothing to defend. There is nothing to prove to anyone anymore and nothing to be right about. There is a lot of peace and joy. Intuitively, that feels like it is the way it would be. And that has been my experience. The happy dream is addressing the mind that believes it is part of the world and that to give up the world is going to involve some sort of cost, retribution, or vengeance. Friend, that scenario makes sense to the ego. The other scenario makes sense to spirit. David, vengeance must have a focus. Otherwise is the avenger's knife in his own hand and pointed to himself. And he must see it in another's hand. If he would be a victim of attack, he did not choose. And thus he suffers from the wounds a knife he does not hold has made upon himself. Text chapter 27, section 7, para 4 The projection of the guilt is out onto something in the world. Friend, it is important to put the knife in someone else's hand. <laughs> David, that is the symbol for all the things in the world that seem to be cause of upset. You fired me. That hurt. I got this disease because I was near the canal. A flood washed away my home. Putting the knife in another's hand is saying that I am victimized by a person or something in the world that is not myself. Or to share an example which is a little more subtle, I could be beating myself up, inflicting wounds upon myself. But that is still something taking place out on the screen. 
The mind is still not aware that it is mind. If it can believe that it can attack itself, it certainly does not perceive itself as mind, as mind that cannot attack. There is no attack. Mind cannot attack. This is the purpose of the world he sees. And looked thus, the world provides the means by which this purpose seems to be fulfilled. The means attest the purpose, but are not themselves a cause. Nor will the cause be changed by seeing it apart from its effects. Text chapter 27, section 7, para 5. That is interesting. And looked at thus, the world provides the means by which this purpose seems to be fulfilled. Everything in the projected world is used to justify the mind's belief in separation. It is used as a means for reinforcing and holding on to the belief in separation. Every time you think about a scenario in which you did not get your way or you were seemingly treated unfairly, those are like memories of images. And whenever those memories of images are called upon as justification for the feeling of upset or attack, they are being used as a means to hold on to the belief in a separate identity. There is nothing in any of those scenarios that is the cause of your upset. The stepping stone is to say, I want a different way of looking at the world, where the body and the world and all the seeming objects in the world are given over to the Holy Spirit and used for another purpose. The miracle is the means. What is a miracle? Towards the end of the workbook, there is a section called What is a Miracle? It says, A miracle is a correction. It does not create, nor really change at all. It merely looks on devastation, the cosmos, and reminds the mind that what it sees is false. The miracle shows you that the false is false. Images are images. Illusions are the same. You can see that the top rung of the ladder would be just to see the false as false.